Good morning, Rock. Good morning, good morning. We're going to start our worship service singing together. And if you'll be standing in the presence of the Lord, we'll get started here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you.
Well, good morning, Rock. It's great to see you this morning, and uh, welcome. It's great to have you here. You can go ahead and take a seat as we take a look at a few announcements as we uh, prepare for uh, our service this morning. Um, it is a blessing to be together, and uh, if you are with us here in person or if you're with us online, thank you for joining us. Um, if you're here today and you uh, are first time with us, you should have gotten a piece of paper that uh, has information about the Rock on it, and uh, uh, there is also a place on there for you to fill out your name. Let us know you were here today. Uh, you can drop that if you'd like to fill it out for us. You can drop it in the gold bowl on the back uh, counter. Uh, and we'd love to, uh, love to know you're with us and send you some additional information about, about the rock. Um, <clears throat> our Kids on the Rock program will be taking place today. Uh, this is for kids who are ages four years through the fifth grade. And uh, if, uh, you, if you're interested in your children attending that, we'll be releasing them just prior to the message um, so they can go up and, and uh, there will be a craft time and there will be a lesson uh, that is more in keeping with, uh, with their, um, their level of understanding. And uh, we are, uh, um, we'll, we'll let you know. If you have not yet um, checked your children in, though, if you could do that now, that would be great, part of our security process. Uh, you can go ahead and go out into the commons area. There's someone at the counter there, and they will check your children in, uh, and then you'll be sure to be able to get them um, when you're done. Um, we haven't figured out what to do if nobody comes to get them, but, but uh, the security part, but we'll, we'll figure that out when the time comes. Um, this, uh, by the way, for those of you who are online, there will be no Zoom connection following the service today. Um, we're going to try that every other week uh, in, the, in the future here, so there will not be a Zoom Connect meeting uh, after our service today, so don't be looking for that. Our Faith Promise celebration is coming up this, well, begins this week. Um, on Wednesday night here at the church, there will be a potluck. Um, and, um, and then uh, Jeremy and Julie will be sharing with us. They're here today. Um, Jeremy and Julie Bunker, go ahead and stand up and let us know. You're, there they are. All right. <laughs> Uh, I know it's unusual to have your, you know, your international workers with you the week before your actual con conference, but uh, of course Jeremy and Julie are, are ours, we like to claim them. Um, they are from The Rock and we are excited to have them back to share with us what's going on um, with them and where they're, where they're ministering. And so that's Wednesday night. Um, if um, we, were, we had thought about doing a... Um, um, a live stream of that uh, because of the sensitive nature of the location in which they work we we can't do a live stream uh, and in fact next sunday when uh, jeremy and julie are sharing with us during the message portion of the service we will we will have to stop our live stream um, so uh, so just so that you're aware uh, and please if you are letting people know about um, what's going on at the rock uh, please do not share um, um, a lot of information uh, concerning the, the bunkers um, as, uh, um, as they're in a, what is known as a creative access uh, nation. So, uh, but at any rate, so uh, Wednesday night here at 6.30, uh, if you'd like to attend dinner, uh, we'll do that at 6.30, and then at 7, around 7 o'clock, uh, we'll have uh, Jeremy and Julie sharing with us. Um, then on Saturday morning, there is a men's breakfast at 8.30 here at the church, and then um, uh, following the breakfast, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, but you might not want to dress up for the breakfast. Okay, and then at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the women will be having a women's tea uh, with, uh, with Julie, and uh, they will be uh, le uh, learning more there as well. And that's at the home of the Dodges, uh, Scott and Janet Dodge. Scott won't be there. Scott will be working here. Um, that's what's happening after the men's breakfast, is uh, a bunch of guys are going to go out here to the north side and be working on the fellowship courtyard. Um, getting it prepared for seating and uh, for getting our sprinklers going and all of that. Uh, you'll hear more about that in just a few minutes at our, during our God of Work section. But want you to know that so that uh, you maybe if you want to hang around and do a little work out in the yard uh, following our men's breakfast, you might want to dress for it appropriately. So, all right. And uh, those are all the announcements that we have to take time for. So let's, let's um, bow uh, before the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, it is so good to be your children, um, adopted by the, blood of, by, by the blood of Christ, given the spirit of adoption, brought into your family, made whole and complete. 
And Father, you have filled us with your spirit so that we might, we might continually be transformed into your likeness. Lord, I know we, we oftentimes will say that this is the desire of our heart, but we resist many times those areas that you wish to adjust in us, change in us, call into question in us. And so we pray today that we would, that we would submit ourselves to you as we come before you this morning. May your spirit have full control of our worship. May you lead us in worship and fill our hearts and minds with the fullness of our Father that we might uh, lift our voices uh, in joy uh, and in wonder that you love us. And Father, we pray that, that you would be glorified in all that, we, all that we say, but also in all that we do, all that we are. Let us go out from here and continue worshiping you with our lives for your glory and praise, for that is why we are here, oh God. Thank you for your goodness. Bless this time, we pray. In Jesus' name.
For it is by grace that you have been saved, not by works so that no one may boast. Father, we stand here this morning awashed in the rain of your grace, feeling the cleansing power of your spirit, the blood of Christ pouring over us. Not just washing away our sin, but each stain of sin. The very remembrance of our sin washed away. Far as the east is from the west, <laughs> no more remembered by our holy God. What grace is this? That the only thing our God cannot do is remember our sin. Let us walk in that purity and that holiness. Give us the grace to forget as well. That we not be encumbered by the memory of our own sins and failures, O oh God, but that we might stand in the strength of Christ Jesus, filled with His Holy Spirit, 
made righteous and just before the law, filled with his love, that we might live in the fullness of the freedom that Christ has purchased for us. Confident and full of joy. For this brings light to the world and it brings glory to the name of our God. So in all this, we give you thanks and praise. We worship you, O oh God, and we thank you in Christ's holy name. come to the time in our service this morning where we uh, stop to take a look to see where we see God at work. Uh, the scriptures tell us God is always working. Jesus said, my father is always working and, and, uh, and that he joins him in that work. And so if that is what our Lord does, if that is what Jesus does, then, then is that not what we are called to be about as well? Recognizing where we see God working and stepping into the fullness of his work. Sometimes that means overseas, and next week we'll be enjoying hearing about what God is doing in another part of the world. But sometimes it's in our own backyard, uh, literally. Um, and uh, uh, today we want, uh, things have, have been happening uh, in our own backyard. And so I'm going to ask uh, Don and, and uh, Scott to come and share with us what's happening in our backyard. Good morning, by the way. Uh, literally, in our own backyard, right out that door, right there, uh, we're turning the north side of this property into a fellowship courtyard. And so far, I don't know if any of you have seen it, we've kind of cleaned everything off, we've killed the grass, we've turned that storage container parallel to the back of the building. We're going to kind of doll that up so it doesn't look like a storage container. Uh... Next Saturday morning, we're going to have a men's breakfast right here where Jeremy's going to kind of share with us a little bit of uh, his testimony and things going on. I encourage all of you men to come. We're going to bring in some sausage, egg, bacon, and if I can be convinced, maybe some hotcakes. But uh, we'll have that back here. And then immediately afterwards, or a few little bit afterwards, we're going to go out and we're going to – Wally's going to plow this up or – Till this dirt up this week, and we're going to have some topsoil brought in. So the idea next week, next Saturday, is to rake it out, spread the topsoil, maybe get it rolled out. And if we have time and we have the, the bodies to frame in the three pads we're going to put the pavilions on. You can see the pavilion. Um, if anybody has forms or lumber that they want to donate or know where we can get them cheap let me know or let don know or let pastor sean know uh, the price of lumber has gone through the roof so we're kind of struggling with that portion of it right now so the idea is uh, rake out spread topsoil next week and then of course we're going to have a uh, we're going to have to uh, do the pads we're going to have to have a day where we uh, put in all the sprinklers we're going to have a day where these guys need to be put together they come in a box or boxes, and so we're going to need some help on all of that. So far, you guys, this thing has literally cost us nothing. And I think by the end of it, it's going to cost us nearly nothing. So that's been a blessing, right? Eh? Amen. So that's kind of the we're, – we're pushing to kind of get the get this before, you, you know, the middle of June so the grass can start growing before it gets too hot. They want some nice lush grass out there. So short order, we need help next weekend. And then we're going to need help uh, putting together the, uh, the pavilions. More news is that as we get those and we get everything, the pads poured and all that stuff. Um, but just come, bring your, bring your bodies. We can use the help next Saturday. 
8.30 here. Don, anything else I'm praying? If you know, if you got lumber or forms or anything, you know where we can get forms for cheap, let me know. Uh, that's kind of the next big step this week. So it's going to look beautiful, guys. It's going to be a really nice place to hang out and play bocce ball or croquet. If you're younger, it will also be a place to play volleyball. Um, bocce ball. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, we are very excited about uh, the many different things that we'll be able to do out there, including having lunches after services, including uh, being able our, some of our kids' classes can go out there during the nicer times of the year. I mean, we're just, we're just really excited about it. So. I, I should make a correction in terms of so far it hasn't cost us anything and, and a lot of the groundwork is going to be donated and so there will be no cost in that. Um, obviously the costs of, of, of uh, the, of the uh, pavilions and, and, the, and the concrete and those kinds of things are, are um, we're going to want to run some electric wire out there so we have lights and that kind of thing. So there will be costs involved. Um, but you need to know that, that uh, there have been people who have stepped up uh, with this project and have said, look, I, I, we'll, we'll donate this, that, or the other thing. And so at this point, the entire project, apart from, I mean, without stepping into the Ready, Set, Grow account or anything, the entire project has been paid for. Um, and so we're, uh, this is exciting. Um, so, all right. Um, for our scripture reading this morning, turn with me in your Bibles again to John chapter 20. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I once again had the joy of being able to, you know, there are certain places that have mosh pits. Um, we have a joy pit, and it was right over here this morning, and, um, um, and that, was, uh, uh, that was cool. <laughs> I want to thank those who stepped in and stepped up today. Uh, we had some, some sickness uh, that the worship team was dealing with, and so we had... Uh, um, you know, uh, Jennifer stepped in right you know, on the day of, and, uh, and then we had problems with our, our tech everything, and, and Dave had to re rebooted everything, got everything going again this morning. It's, I mean, uh, I appreciate so much the, the work as people stepped in and stepped up in ways that uh, um, are mo more than normal here, um, even though normally every Sunday um, they're doing that. So appreciate that. Scripture this morning is from John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. Uh, this continues uh, from last week. Uh, this is continuing on the day of uh, Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday of Jesus. And it says in verse 19, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. We're going to release our kids at this time to go to Kids on the Rock, uh, those who are four years old through the fifth grade, if you would like them to go. Um, they are obviously also welcome to stay if you would like them to keep them here. I walked into the uh, church this morning and came in and headed toward my office and no sooner had I gotten halfway there and somebody about this big comes running up and gives me this giant hug. It's like, boy, not everybody gets to go to work and have that happen. Every, you know. I'm not sure if all of you are aware of this or not, but our friend, one of our elders here at the congregation, Ralph Dawson, recently had a pretty serious scare uh, with his health. Um, you may have noticed that he wasn't with us on Easter Sunday. Um, well, he had gone to the hospital uh, that Sunday morning to get checked out because of some dizziness and fatigue that he had been experiencing the day before and overnight. And uh, by the time they were done checking him out, uh, it was determined that he had a 98% blockage of an artery and he needed a stent put in, which they did immediately. 
Now, uh, praise God, all went well. He and Val have actually spent the last week at a conference in Colorado Springs. It didn't stop them, but for a day. Um, but, it, but it's pretty, th pretty scary to think of just how close um, he ca we came to losing our friend and our, our partner in the gospel uh, from this earth. And uh, we're, we're so glad that the Lord graciously uh, kept him around for us. Um, later, uh, when Ralph and I were talking about this, he told me a story about fear um, that he had had. Uh, and I thought it was such a good story, I thought I would tell it today. Uh, I did call him. Uh, I, had he been here, I would have had him tell the story, but, but he gave me permission to tell it in his, ob in his absence. Um, when Ralph was a pilot with Mission Aviation Fellowship in Indonesia, he once had to fly a, a, a missionary to a village for a dedication of a new church building um, among a people group that had been known for their aggression against strangers not so many years before. Uh, and he told me that when, when, when they arrived, things were strangely quiet in the village. In fact, uh, he and the missionary were kind of standing there almost all by themselves. And then suddenly a band of men carrying long spears and decorated a little bit like, like this um, came charging out of the jungle uh, uh, with blood-curdling screams and shouts and everything else. And, and uh, Ralph said that, well, as all of us would be, he was startled and, and uh, in fact became quite anxious as the group continued to charge toward them. Uh, but when he looked at the missionary, <laughs> he saw no anxiety at all. Well, uh, as they got closer, Ralph <laughs> felt fear beginning to rise up inside of himself. He literally started, he tells me, he, he started thinking about how the headlines would read when the bodies of this missionary and he were find, found along the riverbank um, and what it would tell, you know, how the world would respond and all of this going through his mind. While the missionary still continued to be totally unfazed to what was an obvious threat, as far as Ralph was concerned. Well, finally, the, the, the warriors descended upon them, and they actually put hands on them, and they picked them up and lifted them over their shoulders and, and began to carry them away. And uh, Ralph thought he'd met his doom. He, 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 he frantically looked at the missionary, who was, who was quite peaceful and even smiling. It's like, well, what is this? Ultimately, they were carried into the church building, which Ralph had visions of being burned down around them, but instead... Uh, there was, instead of an execution, there, there was a dedication service for the, for the church there. Turns out that this tribe held on to their warrior-like cultural heritage, and it was displayed at important events and gatherings, kind of like, you know, kind of like a bunch, of, a bunch of Scots pulling out their bagpipes and, and, and kilts on special occasions. I mean, it's essentially the same kind of thing. So they were never in any real danger. Although it has to be said that this missionary must have had a mischievous bent to him because not once did he tell Ralph in this panic state of his that everything was fine. Um, he hadn't given him a heads up on it at all. Now today it, makes, it all makes for a great story. It's a, it's a good story. He, uh, we can all laugh about it. It's kind of fun. But the danger could have been real. Right? I mean, I mean there, there are some elements of this story that are reminiscent of the incident of 1956 when missionary Bill Elliott and his colleagues, along with an MAF pilot named Nate Saint, were killed by the attacking tribesmen of the Wadani tribe in South America. Ralph was pretty young and inexperienced at the time of, of, of his experience there, and uh, you know, this, I'm sure that was in the back of his mind. He didn't have all of the information on the face of what was happening. And it all looked pretty bleak. And so it, we, we can't blame him. From his perspective, it seemed appropriate to be alarmed when a group of armed men come rushing out of the jungle, charging directly toward you. I think that would kind of disrupt all of us a little. And the only reason the missionary was at peace throughout the whole incident was that he knew something that Ralph didn't. He knew what this was. In the passage that we just read, we find the disciples of Jesus hiding away. In fear. It says that there on that first Easter Sunday, they were locked in an upper room, and John says that they were locked in that room for fear of the Jews. Today, with all the information we have in retrospect, we kind of shake our heads at their foolishness or, or their lack of faith of these disciples. But unlike Ralph's situation, the danger they faced was not imagined, and their concerns were very real. This, this very powerful religious group of religious leaders 
had just convinced the Roman government to execute a man who for the most part was very popular with the people, just for claiming that he, had been the, that he was the son of God. That was, that was what they did. And so they, they, they went out and they actually convinced the Romans to execute him. And if they could take down the miracle-working Jesus, well, you would think they would certainly have the ability to do away with them as well, if they so chose. And with Jesus dead, they might want to put an end to his teaching once and for all by either imprisoning, imprisoning them or, or just killing them. They seemed to have the power to do it. And so they were in hiding. And chances are, given the same set of circumstances, we probably would have been right there hiding with them. I don't know that we would be shaking our heads quite so vigorously. But even as they cowered in fear, this day had also brought some unbelievable stories their way. Mary Magdalene had just come to them and told them that she had spoken with Jesus. And apparently so had Peter. You know, it's funny because that story is not actually contained in our Gospels. We don't have an account of Jesus meeting Peter anywhere on that Easter Sunday morning. And yet, both Luke and the Apostle Paul tell us that Peter had an encounter with the risen Christ. It was just something that was not recorded. It was something that apparently Peter didn't want to talk about. I don't know. Then finally, Cleopas and another disciple a couple that we didn't even know existed, showed up to tell everyone that they had just been with Jesus for at least an hour along the, si along the road to Emmaus and in one of their homes. Luke 24 tells us that all of this was occurring. All of these people were coming and going just prior to the events that we read about in John 20. We begin the account in Luke in verse 33, where Luke is, is still writing about Cleopas and his friends when he says, and they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, now this is not Cleopas saying this, this is the group that they came to, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. That would be to Simon Peter. Verse 35 says, then they told, that is Cleopas and his friend, they told what had happened to them on the road and how Jesus was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So here we have the disciples hiding away, answering the door with great care. You can almost imagine some of the suspicion, the quietness, as different ones came and went through the course of the day, quietly trying to figure out just what was going on. He had these reports, but nothing, you know, when suddenly, in the middle of all that, both Luke and John point out that Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, peace was the last thing the disciples had been experiencing that day. We realize that, right? I mean, there was no peace. It, 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 the day began with great fear and grief. It continued with utter confusion and incredulity at the reports of resurrection. And now they experience the utter terror, mixed with joy, of a dead man suddenly appearing seemingly out of thin air right there in the room with them. This is not a peaceful gathering at this point. I don't know about you, but having someone who has died show up in a locked room, even a friend, would kind of freak me out. So it's ironic, to say the least, that the first words out of Jesus' mouth are, peace be with you. When, this ver when, when his very appearance would create anything but peace. But showing up out of thin air is kind of a thing that will declare pretty clearly to the disciples that things are different now. You remember last week we began a series, this series of messages where we're talking about some of the appearances of Jesus between his resurrection and his ascension. And that one of the primary things that he's teaching, the, the, one of the primary themes of that time period is Jesus coming along and letting his disciples know that things are different now. Some, they, they've changed. Things are not as they were in the tomb, that's for sure. 
He's no longer dead. But neither will they return to the way they had been before the crucifixion. That's what we learned last week when we took a look at, what, at his encounter with Mary Magdalene. Where he said, don't, don't hang on to that. Don't hang on to me. I, I'm, this is not going to be the same. Things are different now. You can listen to that on the app or on the website. Now, obviously, Jesus is different. That, that, that's, that goes without saying. He didn't, he didn't used to be able to just appear in a locked room before. You know? I mean, it wasn't like Jesus just, just pop in without opening the door. But his glorified body had peculiarities that seemed to go far beyond what even his mortal body could do before. This fact would become obvious again later when they would watch him ascend into heaven. You know, physical human bodies don't ascend. Not without something pulling them up. Again, this is not a human body thing. So, so Jesus himself was different. His body had changed this glorified body. But, but things were different in other ways as well. Not the least of which is peace itself. What it was, what it is, what it, what it brings about in our lives, that all changed. Things were different. And the disciples were about to get a crash course in moving from fear to peace in Jesus. In fact, the very first thing that Jesus says to his disciples after his resurrection, the first thing he says is, peace be with you. And John actually points out that he says it twice, in just a few verses. Now, we all know that the narratives of Scripture are in, are, are in general a pretty brief in their descriptions of things. Okay, so that what I mean is that the, you know, as you're reading the story of the gospel, the, the story is, is brief, it's condensed. For example, the entire resurrection event and the 40 days that follow right up to Christ's ascension take up a mere 53 verses in the book of Luke. 53 verses. Well, John, of course, he's more long-winded. He drags it out over 56 verses um, and two chapters. In other words, the Gospels present a very condensed retelling of the life of Christ. We have surprisingly, well, we have surprisingly large number of stories with a very small amount of writing. So when the gospel writer takes the time and the space to present the detail that Jesus said something twice in a short span of time, it's important that we take note of it. We need to ask the question, why? Why would, why would John go to that trouble? What was, what was so important about this? Because in John, 19, in John 20, verse 19, John writes, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then in verse 21, we read, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Why? This is unusual, to say the least, to greet people twice in the same manner in a matter of moments. It doesn't make any sense. Thus, this is not the typical greeting. Rather, Jesus is making a point, two points, actually, about how things are different now. The first of these points is that since Jesus has overcome death, the disciples no longer had to be afraid. They can live in peace. John gives that as a rather matter-of-fact matter account in verse 20. You know, when, when he said this, when he said, peace be with you, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. That's all he gave. But Luke lingers here a little bit. He gives a little bit more of the sense of the, of the process the disciples go through in coming, coming to grips with what they're experiencing. Verse 36 says, uh, of Luke 24, he says, it says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? 
And why do doubts arise in your heart? See, my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they, were, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Presumably, because spirits or ghosts don't eat food. And thus, Jesus ate the food to demonstrate that, in fact, he was a human being. The point here, though, is that, is, is that Jesus is proving that it is really him. That he who died had indeed been raised from the dead. That's what this whole episode's about. The concept that even with him standing right there in front of him, this concept was going to be hard for them to get their heads around, right? I mean, so Jesus, Jesus patiently and deliberately takes them through the whole process, inviting them to touch him, to observe his body's wounds, to observe you know, him eat with them. Because he knows that their brains are not keeping up with their reality right now. Consider how honestly the scriptures communicate what the disciples are thinking. I love this. Luke says that they disbelieved for joy and marveled. What does that even mean? That doesn't mean a lot in English to disbelieve for joy. It's a contradiction. It's a contradiction in terms because that's exactly what they were experiencing. Contradictions in their conception of reality. This doesn't happen. They can't believe what their eyes are seeing. They can't believe what their hands are touching. And while it fills them with joy, they still don't trust it. While they're marveling, <laughs> they're not sure they believe it. But here, here he is. And here they all are, experiencing him together. You can, almost, you can almost imagine them looking, you know, looking at each other as if to say, are you seeing this too? I know one of the paintings, um, go to the next slide. Um, I love the picture where I circled the guys in the back. You know, it's like they're looking at each other saying, you're seeing this, right? I, I'm not, this isn't just me. This is unbelievable to them. Things are definitely different now. And they're just beginning to understand how. Because honestly, believing that Jesus is alive while being necessary is only the beginning of what Jesus wants them to realize here. See? He knows that they will accept the resurrection as soon as their brains catch up with this new reality. As soon as their brains catch up, they will be able to accept the notion that Jesus has been raised from the dead. They won't understand how it happened, but they will accept that it happened, because he's right there. But Jesus also wants to bring them to comprehend how his being alive makes things different now. How it makes things different, not just for Jesus, not just for him, but for them as well. And to do this, he uses the common even the everyday greeting, shalom. That's actually what he said. You know, that's, you know, we have the peace be with you. I mean, as soon as we say peace be with you, anybody who has any kind of liturgical background thinks, and also with you. You know, and, and so it, that phrase is a religious phrase that has very little meaning to us. Peace be with you, and also with you. Okay. That's the English translation of the Hebrew word shalom. In other words, Jesus came in the room, pops in, and, and he essentially says, hey, how you doing? This was the common greeting of the day. This wasn't, this wasn't any religious thing. This was the absolute average thing that any Jew would say to another Jew as they walked down the street. Shalom, shalom. How you doing? I'm fine, how are you? Good. <laughs> the only difference is Jesus had just come back from the dead. 
He had just appeared in the room, and yet here he greets his disciple with this common Hebrew greeting that is still used today, shalom. On the surface, the greeting seems so inappropriately nonchalant for someone who just came back from the dead. You would think something bigger would have been said. But Jesus is using this common greeting to indicate to his disciples that they were, be they were being given a shalom that is uncommon. That is actually nothing short of extraordinary. And in order to emphasize that, he says it twice. It's as if he's using this greeting to reinforce something that he had taught them previously. Like when he said in John 14, 27, Shalom I leave with you, my shalom I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Why? Because they have his shalom. These disciples who had been hiding away in fear are confronted and comforted with the shalom of the resurrected one, with the peace of Christ. He's showing them that from now on they can live in a fearless peace. Jesus proves it to them, both by demonstrating it as, with himself as a living example and by showing them in the scriptures that this had been promised all along. The living example, of course, is his resurrected body. This is why Jesus draws attention to his own body, to the scars, to the reality of his resurrection. He shows them that the principalities and the powers did their worst. He shows them that the religious leaders crucified him. And what did they have to show for it? An empty tomb. A lot of questions. And soon, an unstoppable movement of the Spirit of God. Christ is alive and standing in front of them. He's saying, whom shall you fear? Then we see in Luke 24, verses 44 to 48, he goes on from just standing in front of them, he goes on from just showing them his, the nail marks in his hands and demonstrating, hey, I have overcome the worst that they could do to me. He then goes on, in verse 44 he says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day be raised from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. You see, Jesus shows them that not only has he been raised from the dead, but this has been the plan all along. Even when it seemed as if the wheels were coming off and all hell was breaking loose all around them, God was still in control. This was still God's plan. He was pulling the levers of history. He was manipulating those who thought they were successfully resisting his plans. God remains on his throne. And as Paul said, if God be for us, then who can be against us? The disciples might well have hearkened back to the words of David in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves up and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in contempt. Shalom, he says to his frightened little flock. Peace to you, my peace, the peace of the resurrected one I give you. 
Because with the death of death, things are different now. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just that Jesus wins. In his resurrection, we need not fear either. Things are different now. Jesus introduces to them just how different they are by saying it again, Shalom. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Why this time? Why does he say Shalom again? What does this have to do with peace? Well, if there's one thing that stands out in Jesus' ministry, it was, that, it was the complete sense of confidence that he has in his mission and in the one who sent him on it. Right? I mean, you read through the Gospels, I mean, there is no question. He never questions why he's there. He never questions what it is he's about. And he never questions the one who sent him even on the day of his crucifixion, he said, I would rather not do this, but your will, not mine. I trust you, Father. I will stand confidently in you. One place in which this is stated clearly is at the beginning of John 13, just prior to Jesus taking on the role of a household slave to wash his disciples' feet. Verse 3 says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking on a towel, he tied it around his waist, then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus could do this while at peace. In fact, Jesus was continually at peace with whatever was required of him because he knew that he had been sent by God. He knew that he was going back to his Father. And he knew that God had given him everything he would need to fulfill his divine purposes. He knew all of this. He was secure in all of this. Thus, friends, he could love lavishly. He had nothing to protect. He could act freely. He could teach boldly. He could sacrifice willingly. He could live humbly. He could die painfully without fear. Without self-concern. He was secure in his father's love, and so he was able to carry out his mission in an attitude of peace. Now, you want to know just how different things are now? Look at what Jesus says to his disciples and to us then in verse 21. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Did you catch it? In the same way the Father has sent me. Even so, in that very same way, I am sending you. Authorized, equipped, secured, directed, loved. Jesus declares to his disciples that they are secure in him. Not only can they not die, they cannot fail. You say, wait a minute, Sean, there's failure in the church all the time. We see churches fail. We see Christians fail. What do you mean you, you can't fail? The night before this happened, all 11 of the disciples thought Jesus had failed. 
all of hell was rejoicing because they thought God had failed. In Christ, not only can we not die, oh, our bodies can expire, but we will not die. But neither can we fail in Christ. So he begins by saying, Shalom, peace. Do not fear. Do not doubt. Do not hide. Nothing can be taken from you that will not be given back to you a hundredfold. Maybe not in this life. We all know believers who have died. We all read of the persecuted church. We all understand that believers suffer. We should all understand that the prosperity gospel is a bunch of hooey. If what we think is that somehow or other that God is going to bless us with material blessings to no end, that is not the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is we can live in peace knowing that we are secure in Christ, whether things are going well or whether things are going poorly, whether we are enjoying freedom or whether we are somehow imprisoned. Nothing can be taken from you that will not be given back a hundredfold. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Or as Paul writes in Romans 8, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can stand against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also now with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Hmm? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? (laughs) Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus says things are different now. Shalom. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Friends, I look around the church in America today and I see such an abundance of fear. Fear of the government. Fear of persecution. Fear of loss of privilege. Fear of economic collapse. Fear of apostasy. Fear of China. Fear of Russia. Fear of lawlessness. Fear of foreigners. Fear of the future. And Jesus says to all of it, Shalom. Peace out. Things are different now. Things are different for you. Yes, things might not go as you like. Yes, things can become more difficult. 
If you ever read my word, it, it tells you that it will. As you move toward the end, things will become more difficult. Don't think that you'll escape the challenges that other followers of Jesus are facing. But things are different now. They did their worst to Jesus. And Jesus is not only still alive, he sits on the throne. Yes, in this world we will have trouble, but shalom for Christ has overcome the world. Christ has overcome the principalities and the powers. Christ has overcome any evil thing that you can imagine happening in your life. Do we believe this, church? Do we believe it? If so, then let's stop wringing our hands and moaning like those who have no hope. Let's stop plotting our revenge and our resurgence to power or dominance or whatever it is we have in our mind. Instead, let us live and walk in the shalom of God. Praying with those who persecute you. Praying for them. Praying for those who spitefully use you. Walk the extra mile with the one who unjustly compels you to do so. Hate the dark, but love those whom, for whom Jesus died. We can do this because things are different now. We're not bound to ourselves. We're bound to the resurrected one who has adopted us into his family, made us his children, filled us with his spirit and has lifted us above all of these things. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and we are raised with him. We have nothing to fear. Next week, we're going to take note of a new power that enables us to live in the middle of that peace every day. Let's pray together. Precious Father in heaven, we are so grateful so grateful for the grace and the wonder that pours down on us like rain every day. Wash away our fears, I pray. Wash away our anxieties. Fill us, O oh God, with, a, with your spirit. that we might be free as Christ was free to administer your grace and truth to anyone and everyone as they have need. Come Holy Spirit. Change us for your glory and your praise. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. To see things like you do, God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom to know just what to do.
receive these words of blessing. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord, today, tomorrow, and always. In Jesus' name.